Petrov got up from the bed. The woman beside him turned over, her sleepy eyes fluttering open. Telling him it was too early. She exhaled warmly by Petrov's ear, coaxing him to stay with her a bit longer. As Petrov got dressed, he explained he had official duties to attend to. The woman reached out, looping an arm around his waist, reminding him, even if Roland has taken Chang Ji's stronghold, Petrov is in control here. Petrov fondly patted her head, replying, but his highness is the true lord of the western territories. Outside, the biting cold air reminded him of a journey he made a year ago, when he had braved a snowstorm, sailing to the border town to deliver a threat letter from Chang Ji stronghold on behalf of Duke Ryan. And now, he was on his way to the border town again. As he walked through the outer city district, heading for the docks, a commotion from a street corner drew his attention. Distinct shouts of demon and hang her pierced the air. Petrov sent a knight beside him to investigate. It didn't take long for the knight to control the scene. Two children and an elderly woman were kneeling on the ground. The children's clothes were ragged, making them appear all the more pitiable in the biting cold. The old woman suddenly pointed at a red-haired girl, accusing her as a demon and telling Petrov, this girl has become a witch. A blonde boy stood in front of the girl, his posture aggressive as if ready to pounce, his face covered with fresh bruises. He shouted, witches aren't minions of demons. Petrov disregarded the boy, addressing the old woman, asking her how is she sure that the girl is a witch. The elderly woman went on and on, urging Petrov to hang the girl. Growing impatient, Petrov demanded the full story. Reluctantly, the old woman explained that she was a follower of the church, waiting for the holy city of Hermes to send a new priest and rebuild the western church in Changji stronghold. By chance, she had witnessed the red-haired girl using magic to remove snow from the rooftops of local homes. In her recount, the old woman constantly lamented the absurd teachings of Roland and the theater's twisted performances such as the witch diary that muddled right from wrong. After listening, Petrov instructed his knights to take the elderly woman for further interrogation and to arrest all the followers associated with her before his return. Before the woman could protest further, a knight silenced her with a sharp slap. Petrov then turned his attention to the terrified young girl, asking her to demonstrate her abilities. The blonde boy once again stepped up to protect the girl. Falling to her knees, she showed no immediate response, evidently frightened. Petrov continued, stating that if she could prove herself a true witch, he would provide her shelter. Hesitantly, she stretched out her hands into the snow, forming a snowball. Slowly, the snowball melted into water in her hands. Petrov reached for the young girl, telling her to accompany him. When she lifted her head to ask where they were going, he smiled and told her, a place suitable for a witch. An attendant beside him gently lifted the girl, continuing their journey towards the dock. The blonde boy tried to rush forward but was held back by several knights. His shouts gradually faded into the distance. Aboard the ship, Petrov draped a coat over the girl and served her a bowl of hot porridge. The girl introduced herself as Paper, a street urchin. She took a sip of the porridge and burned her tongue, but eventually managed to finish the warm meal. When Petrov inquired about the boy who had defended her, Paper revealed his name was Snake Fong, and he often brought food for them. She expressed her hopes that Petrov wouldn't capture him. Paper then shared her story. Knowing that people no longer feared witches as they once did, she used her powers to clear the accumulated snow from residents' rooftops in exchange for food. However, she had only cleared snow from three houses. One household drove her away, while the other two provided her with some food. At the fourth house, she encountered the old woman. Petrov patted her head gently, advising Paper to rest well. He promised to bring her more food later in the evening. He added, in three days, she'll be able to meet his highness. Several days later, the ship docked at the border town. Petrov, escorted by guards, entered the castle. Roland welcomed Petrov's arrival, and in turn, Petrov greeted Roland with a respectful bow. After taking a seat, Roland revealed the reason for summoning Petrov, it concerned a matter of utmost importance, one that would shape the future of the entire Western territory, including the Chang Ji stronghold. Petrov's expression grew serious. 
Roland presented a blueprint to him, detailing his plans to build a city on this land. With methodical precision, Roland explained his vision. Within the vast boundaries of this city and its lands, a singular set of laws would govern all which is overseen by the newly established city hall. No noble, regardless of their rank, would be permitted to meddle in the affairs of the city. Petrov felt a jolt of recognition in his heart. He had harbored a similar idea a year ago, but Duke Ryan had dismissed it. The fact that Roland was sharing this with him now indicated that the decision had been made, and no one would be able to stand in his way. Petrov realized that his primary objective at this point was to find a way to ensure his interests were secured in the midst of this change. Subsequently, Petrov inquired, if the five major families are restricted from involving themselves in the city's affairs, how can his family serve and support Roland? Roland seemed somewhat taken aback by the question but was appreciative of Petrov's proactive attitude. He took a sip of his tea before replying, as long as Petrov's family is willing to accept his governance, he can continue to assist Roland in managing the Chang'e stronghold. Petrov quickly responded, whether it's him or his father, they have always followed Roland's will. Roland interrupted him, clarifying, he was not referring to individuals but to territories. Any noble families that seeks his protection will have their territorial governing rights revoked. Whether it's laws, law enforcement, or any other policies, everything will be based on the ordinances issued by the city hall. Petrov hesitated for a moment. Roland continued, the territories can still be passed down from generation to generation, including their noble titles. They are still free to manage various industries and own businesses. These industries and lands will belong to their family, and no one will infringe upon them. The territories they possess remain unchanged compared to before. In fact, under the stimulus of the new policy, they might even flourish even more. Petrov didn't provide an immediate answer. After excusing himself, Nightingale appeared, asking Roland whether if he think Petrov will agree. Roland took a sip of his warm tea, he was not certain. Petrov has to persuade his father first. If they don't agree, it would be very regrettable. Nightingale knew Roland was fond of Petrov. Among the nobles, Petrov wasn't narrow-minded and always seized opportunities. He was also very adept at doing business and trade. Nightingale hopped off the table, not wishing to dwell on this topic any longer. The new witch will arrive soon. She will call Wendy over. For security reasons, and under Skrull's suggestion, the witch union decided that every time they received a foreign witch, Nightingale should first verify the newcomer's identity by discerning any of fear lies. Roland couldn't be present during this, as the witches didn't carry God punishment stone with them. There was always the risk that a newcomer might lash out unexpectedly, causing unintended harm. Roland found this protocol a bit amusing but understanding the witch's good intentions, he decided to comply. Leaving the office, he returned to his office and immediately summoned Barov, the chief administrator of the city hall. Barov was surprised that Roland wanted to recruit witches with a monthly salary of one gold. Roland explained that this salary was on par with other top professional positions, and by offering it, he was not just giving them a wage but also affirming their status here in the western region. Barov inquired why Roland didn't mobilize the people to seek out witches, just like how he did with the spies. Roland replied that he didn't want to mimic the church's methods, he hoped the witches would come forward willingly. Just as Barov was taking his leave with a bow, Wendy entered swiftly informing Roland that the identity of the new witch had been verified. Roland chuckled, commenting that they were being overly cautious. Wendy firmly replied that such prudence was necessary, emphasizing that Roland's personal safety was their top priority. Roland was deeply moved and instructed Wendy to bring in the new witch. The girl was about 15 or 16 years old, with dirt-matted red hair, and her eyes radiated timidity and panic. For a moment, Roland was at a loss for words. According to the records, she called herself Paper, born on the outskirts of the Chang'e stronghold. She became an orphan after a heavy snowstorm three years ago. Roland knew that she was still in a state of shock and would likely need a significant amount of time to adjust to her new life. 
He looked to Wendy and told her to first give the girl a bath, let her rest for a while, and ensure she had a good meal. Wendy bowed in acknowledgement and then led the girl away. Steam wafted in waves from the tub inside the bathroom. Wendy once again relished the joy of being an elder sister. Without the disguise of clothes, the girl's frail body covered in wound and malnutrition was laid bare before Wendy's eyes. Fortunately, she was a witch, and with proper care, she would recover in no time. After cleaning herself, it was time for a delightful bath. Wendy tested the water temperature before gently placing the girl into the tub. The girl, Paper had awakened her powers two years ago. Wendy explained to her knowledge about witches and magic. Holding her close, Wendy reassured her that everything would be all right once she settled in the border town. Suddenly, the bathroom door burst open. Lily, with a towel in hand, rushed in, pulling a puzzled rem behind her. Lily leaned over the tub's edge, curiously staring at Paper, startling her. Wendy introduced them gently, saying, Rem and Lily are witches from the border town. When they first arrived, they were just as apprehensive as Paper. Especially Rem, who was quite timid. When asked about Paper's abilities, she softly responded that she could melt snow. Paper couldn't turn water back into ice, but she could rapidly cool hot water. Lily fetched a basin of hot, bubbly water and prompted Paper to demonstrate her skill. The girl cautiously dipped her hand into the basin. In moments, the steaming surface cooled and the bubbles dissipated, leaving the water clear and transparent. Petrov once again visited Roland's office. After bowing respectfully, he expressed his desire to serve Roland, and so did his family. Roland was immediately in high spirits. Petrov candidly spoke of the remarkable transformation he had witnessed in Border Town over the past few days, stating it was the kind of city he also envisioned. He hoped to see his own territory thrive similarly and wished for his family to join this new city. Roland was slightly moved by these words. Petrov planned to return to the stronghold to convey this to his father. Roland told Petrov that there were the other four major families and all the nobles of the Western Territory. Any family willing to accept this proposition would be welcomed by the new city without holding any grudges from the past. Roland hoped Petrov would convey this message and once again wished for Petrov to act as his ambassador. Petrov accepted with another heartfelt gesture of placing his hand on his chest. As he was about to leave, Roland called out to him, commending his handling of the witch matter and suggesting that there was no need for concealment in the future. Roland then stretched his arms and headed outside. Entering the garden, Roland sensed something unusual. The trees and plants were too full of life. At first, he thought he was mistaken, but as he ventured deeper, he noticed the olive tree branches bowing down, seemingly paying their respects to him. The grass at his feet leaned to one side as if greeting him. He thought he was tripping. In the center of the garden, Roland stopped in surprise. At the end of the path, there stood a quaint room constructed entirely of plants. A small bonfire burned in the center, and Wendy greeted Roland. Tilly informed Roland that Leaf's abilities had evolved. Leaf had become one with the plants. A wave of concern washed over Roland, fearing that Leaf might not be able to revert to her original form. However, Leaf's voice soon resonated, assuring him, as long as she deactivate her ability, she can return to her normal state. She seemed quite pleased and explained that she could sense every change within the garden. As she spoke, a large rolled-up leaf descended from above, gently unfurling beside Roland to reveal a cup filled with a purple-red liquid. The cup was crafted from overlapping olive leaves. Leaf's abilities had evolved during her regular care of the new crops. When asked if she could extend her power throughout the entire hidden forest, Leaf responded that it would take a long time. Expanding her control would slow her cognition. She could gradually extend her power, possibly covering the entire hidden forest in several years. However, attempting to do so instantaneously might cause her to lose her consciousness. Wendy congratulated Roland on having another evolved witch in the Union. According to Agatha's words, they now equaled half the size of the Federation. Roland smiled and then looked at the little girl sneakily peeking at him from the side. 
Wendy said that they still need to continue testing Paper's ability, but she noticed an odd phenomenon. She snapped her fingers, and two bundles of snow quickly fell from the roof. She then instructed Paper to apply her ability. Roland noticed that the snow close to the bonfire quickly turned into a puddle of water, while the one further away only melted halfway. Wendy picked up the melted water and walked to the wall, knocking on it. Tightly wrapped vines retracted, revealing a hole, and the cold wind from outside rushed in immediately. She asked Paper to use her ability again. To Roland's astonishment, the water in the leaves froze into a thin layer of ice. At first, Roland speculated that it might be a manipulation of time. Still, he quickly dismissed that theory, reasoning that time is just a concept created by humans for convenience and doesn't inherently exist. Wendy dangled a stone in front of paper using a vine, making it sway like a pendulum. Paper used her ability again, but the pendulum's movement remained unchanged. It swung at the same amplitude. Roland realized that paper was influencing the motion of particles, either slowing them down or speeding them up. Of course, paper might not understand this herself, she just released her ability based on her sensations. If Roland guessed correctly, her ability was like a natural catalyst. If paper's ability stabilizes, Border Town might witness a new peak. Just then, a melodious bell tolled from the northwest direction. It was a warning of the demonic beast attack. Nightingale suddenly appeared and rushed over. Roland told her to be careful. Perhaps on this snowy day, only witches were feeling restless, especially the combat witches Tilly brought. They were probably waiting for those mixed-breed demonic beasts that could scale the walls, eager to showcase their skills. Ever since she learned about it, Nightingale had taken an interest, rushing to the scene whenever the alarm rang, probably to see who was the strongest combat witch. Combat witches had their fun, but the support witches were missing out. Maybe it was time to create some new entertainment. With that thought, he summoned Soraya. The beautiful artist, who had made significant contributions to Border Town, looked spirited, her face radiant with a youthful exuberance she couldn't hide. Such a fulfilling life made Soraya very happy, and she was even happier that she could use her abilities to help Roland. Roland was deeply moved by her smile. He called for Soraya this time to design new playing cards, he knew that everyone had grown tired of Gwent. Pulling out a blank paper, Roland quickly sketched the rough design. He explained that there would be four suits, numbered 1 to 13, with an added king and queen card, making a total of 54 cards. Soraya's abilities had come a long way, and using the sketch as a reference, she quickly painted the cards with a coating. Roland told Soraya that there were many ways to play with these cards and asked her to bring Anna and the others. He would teach them how to play. Ferlin stood behind his wife, watching her with a gentle smile as she meticulously chose goods from the stall. At moments like this, Eileen's gaze was always exceptionally serious. Ferlin thought all pieces of meat were priced by weight, so it didn't matter which piece she picked. However, Eileen insisted that while Ferlin liked lean meat, without a bit of fat, the dish wouldn't be fragrant when cooked. So, she had to choose carefully. Ferlin couldn't help but chuckle, telling her to keep selecting as he'd go buy some wheat. Ever since the snowfall, Prince Roland had set up windbreak shelters around the market. There were also notices proclaiming that sales would continue even in winter. This meant that throughout the daunting month of the demons, the town would still offer a steady food supply. People in line recognized Ferlin and even offered him their spots. However, Ferlin showed his gratitude but took his place at the end of the line. A middle-aged man ahead chuckled, commenting that Ferlin truly lived up to his reputation as the once-renowned first knight of the Western Territory. Ferlin was taken aback, he hadn't expected the man to know of his past. The man laughed, saying it was no secret. His children adored Ferlin, with his eldest son even aspiring to be a knight one day. Ferlin smiled and then realized that perhaps, in the future, his highness wouldn't need knights anymore. When Ferlin was the duke's knight, most commoners wouldn't dare meet his gaze let alone having a conversation with him. After his defeat and capture, bringing him to this border town, he had assumed he would merely serve under a different lord. 
Yet, to his surprise, he eventually became a teacher, imparting knowledge to commoners, and during his time being a teacher, he earned people's respect. This respect felt entirely different from his nightly days. People no longer avoided or distanced themselves, instead, they hoped to draw closer to him. Perhaps, he mused, he wasn't meant to be a knight after all. Soon, it was his turn in line. Behind the counter stood a girl, one of the first students he had taught. He was pleased to see his former student now working at the town hall. A look of delight spread across her face after seeing Ferlin, they then exchanged some words. Not wishing to delay others, Ferlin purchased a batch of wheat, hoisted the sack over his shoulder, and stepped aside. Just then, a flash of blue caught his eye. A stunning woman with rare blue hair and delicate features. Ferlin felt as though his blood had frozen, not because of her extraordinary beauty, but because he recognized her. He had seen her likeness in his family's grand hall. And a large portrait of her was hanged in the grand hall. If his memory served him right, she was depicted as the founder of his family lineage. Eileen's voice pulled him from his disarray thoughts, and he responded distractedly. Back home, the image of the woman continued to haunt him. Why, he wondered, had he seen an ancestor of his family in the town? After much contemplation, he decided to return to the Chang-Gi stronghold. He knew too well that having left his family, he shouldn't set foot in the family territory again. But he knew he had to tell this to his father. Upon arriving, to Ferland's astonishment, the first to greet him was his younger brother, Miso. Noticing Ferlin was alone without any attendance, Miso tauntingly asked if Ferlin had returned to ask for money. Ferlin calmly replied that he wasn't there for money and had no intentions of contesting for the heir's position. Ferlin said he have a comfortable life being a teacher in the border town. When Miso heard that Ferlin was teaching commoners in the border town, he dismissed it as a fabricated tale. Miso even went so far as to insult Eileen. Suddenly, a stern voice echoed from behind, causing Miso to flinch. Ferlin turned to find the voice and was met with the gaze of his own father. The nobleman stated firmly that Lady Eileen was in no way inferior to any noble. Miso needed to be respectful. Without sparing another glance at his younger son, the nobleman instructed Ferlin to join him in the study. Ferlin followed his father to the mansion's second floor study room. As they passed through the grand hall, Ferlin's eyes were instinctively drawn to the wall adorned with portraits, and once again, he was met with the visage of the blue-haired woman. Upon entering the room, the nobleman started by mentioning the recent successful performance at the theater. He had seen Ferlin's wife, and it seemed they were leading a good life. Ferlin felt a sudden warmth in his eyes, touched that his father had begun the conversation with this topic. Ferlin shared that they had made a home in the border town and intended to start a family after this year's month of the demons. Ferlin took a deep breath. Ferlin composed himself and spoke of the woman he had encountered in the border town, remarking on her uncanny resemblance to the woman in the portrait in the grand hall. The nobleman's hand trembled, nearly knocking over his teacup. He looked up, eyes widening. Ferlin theorized that the woman might be a descendant of the person in the painting. However, the nobleman immediately shook his head, insisting that it was impossible for her to have descendants. Ferlin, conceding, lowered his gaze, suggesting he might have been mistaken. After a moment of thought, the nobleman voiced that while she couldn't be a descendant, she might very well be the person from the painting herself. Ferlin could hardly believe what he was hearing. The idea was even more incredulous than his own. A person living for over four centuries? The nobleman recounted how Ferlin, as a child, would frequently go into the basement and would often receive a beating for it. It wasn't that the nobleman wanted to be strict, it was because the basement housed a precious heirloom of their founder ancestors. Following his father into the basement. The walls were lined with stones of God punishment, and opening one chest revealed it to be full of magic stones. It was only then that the nobleman confessed, their family lineage was built under the protection of a witch. Their ancestor, in the times of Lady Agatha, had led a group to the tower in the hidden forest. Among them was their housekeeper. He should have accompanied his master Lady Agatha. 
but he had faltered, instead opting to stay behind and oversee their supplies. In some sense, his act was akin to betrayal. After reaching the Western Territory, he was consumed by deep regret and self-blame and documented these feelings. The witch never returned, and their ancestors severed ties with the Federation. From the very beginning, the nobleman knew that everything the church did was wrong, but he was powerless to stop it. The most he could do was ensure that if a witch ever appeared in his territory, he would protect and hide her. Their ancestors, over several generations, had done the same. Ferlin was puzzled as to why the nobleman believed the ancestor might still be alive. The nobleman explained that witches possessed a myriad of powers and were unable to bear offspring, leading him to believe that she might be still alive. The hidden forest was treacherously dangerous. Even witches could not safely return from it. For ordinary person to venture there was tantamount to courting death. However, in his last will, their ancestor had noted this, expressing hope that future generations could journey to the stone tower in the hidden forest, even if just to catch a glimpse. Ferlin opened this long-forgotten journal, and from the very first page, he could feel the remorse imbued within every line. Much of the writing had faded over time, becoming nearly illegible. He took his time and eventually he reached the last page, where the contents of the will were written. Perhaps it wasn't so much a will as it was an unfulfilled wish. The nobleman decided to bring the journal along to meet the Lady Ferlin had spoke of.